right. Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining us for our noon time webinar. You're in for a real treat today for the next hour. Uh, to kick things off, for those of you who might not know me, I'm Jamie Weeks, and I'm the Habitat Hero Coordinator for Audubon Rockies. And today we're going to co-host our presentation with Amy Yarger, our Horticulture Director at the Butterfly Pavilion. So for today's presentation, we're going to learn all about creating that year-round habitat for pollinators. So many pollinators, so much time. A healthy pollinator habitat provides food, shelter, and other resources in the summer and the rest of the year, too. So today we're going to learn about some of the most common and underappreciated native pollinators and how you can help them 365 days a year. So thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. You'll notice this beautiful photograph to orient you. This is at the Butterfly Pavilion, and they were awarded a uh, Habitat Hero Garden in 2015, so we thank them for their support as well for all of our initiatives here with Audubon Rockies. A few things I just wanted to cover first on housekeeping. You'll notice that your phone lines have been muted since we do have a good number of participants today. However, we will still be accepting questions uh, during uh, the presentation and after the main presentation, we'll finish up with the Q&A. So you'll just be using that chat feature on your toolbar to type those messages to the organizer or Audubon Rockies directly to me throughout the session. I'll compile those which we'll use at the end. Also, we'll be recording today's presentation. That is in case you need to cut out early and you have to miss some of this great information, or so you can pass it on to your friends, family, or coworkers who weren't able to join us today. We'll also be sending out some additional links and materials that we'll follow up in communication with. So again, thank you so much for joining us for your noontime webinar. I hope you have your lunch and some drinks and you get to enjoy the show for the next hour. And with so much information to cover, we're going to get started now. And I'm just going to give you a brief, brief overview of Audubon Rockies and the Habitat Hero Program to set up the context and the information that Amy will be providing us today. So as some of you may know, the Habitat Hero Program is a program of Audubon Rockies. And Audubon Rockies is a regional office of National Audubon Society. We're regional in that we cover both Colorado and Wyoming territories. And Audubon is an organization that has championed the protection of birds and their habitat for over a century. And our dedicated staff use a powerful combination of science, education, policy, and on-the-ground conservation to connect people with nature and the power to protect, protect it. Uh, one of our newest but most successful programs, Habitat Heroes, is all about focusing on gauging you all those community members, business owners, landowners, schools, et cetera, on actively restoring natural habitat for not just birds, but butterflies, other pollinators, and those other wild creatures that are so important. Uh, habitat heroes are individuals who make a positive impact in our communities by increasing those natural areas, providing homes and food for wildlife, and also creating those small areas of wildlife habitat to connect those larger green spaces together. We're literally stitching back the landscape one garden at a time. We empower engagement through providing those free resources and connections to local expertise. Today, it's Amy Yarger, uh, so that those individuals can successfully design gardens both small and large using those eco-friendly principles we often talk about, such as using native plants, conserving water, and eliminating pesticides, just to name a few. These actions not only create a welcome place for birds, but they help our environment out too by limiting our water usage and comb combating climate change impacts. We also promote those citizenship through hands-on activities that really benefit the greater community, which it's all about. We engage them, as mentioned, with those resources, um, our workshops and presentations, both in person, now virtual. We have our great social media presence and online platform. Also our community plantings and, of course, the recognition through awards, hence this beautiful photograph with the Habitat Hero Black. <coughs> That's just a brief overview, but for the main star today, it's all about Amy, Yar Amy Yarger. She's the Horticulture Director at the Butterfly Pavilion. She has worked in the public horticulture field since 1996, so 20 years. 
She received a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California in Irvine. And then she went on to study plant-animal interactions at the University of Michigan. Her master's thesis concerned the effects of noxious weeds on pollinator-plant relationships. Her work at the Butterfly Pavilion, where she has been a horticulturist since 2000, she touches on many of her passions, including plants, insects, habitat conservation, and science education. And if you just need a fun fact to feel like you know Amy a little bit better through this virtual presence today, you can know that she starts her work day at 4 a.m. Don't know how she does it. And she usually does this starting with a saw in her hand. Fun tidbit, you might need to ask Amy about this later, why she's starting her work day with a saw in her hand. <laughs> but without further ado, I really want to thank Amy for joining us today, and I will be passing this on over to her so she can engage us with all of her information today. So thank you, Amy, for being with us. Thank you, Jamie, and um, thanks for everyone who's participating in the webinar today. I'm, I've got a... Um, just, I'm so excited to share this information because this is one of my favorite things to talk about in the whole world. Um, and really what my objective um, for this webinar is for everyone is to give everyone a sense of um, what to expect as the year goes forward. You know, we've just come out of summer, we're heading into autumn, uh, we're, the growing season is just about over, but um, the pollinators just don't disappear uh, uh, just because uh, summer ends. And so there's things that you can do in your own backyard habitat or front yard habitat to make that habitat friendly no matter the time of year. So um, you should have a good idea about what pollinators you might see at different times of year in our region and what resources are limiting during those different times of year. So um, a lot of people don't realize that there are a lot of pollinators out there in the world. So I think if you ask most people, they'll come up with, you know, honeybees um, and maybe, you know, monarch butterflies. But, uh, you know, around the world, there are about 200,000 different insects that pollinate. The vast majority of those are some of those things like bees and butterflies. But if you look down here at the bottom, this other is 2%. That might even include things like thrips. Um, and then, of course, you've got our vertebrate pollinators, so pollinators with backbones like hummingbirds, and in that case, there's even some mammals that pollinate. Um, so, but the majority really come from these top four orders. You've got your bees, your flies, your beetles, and then your butterflies kind of bringing up the rear. Um, and each of these groups have specific adaptations to being great pollinators, and so they have some different life cycles that we'll kind of touch on in this webinar and some different habitat needs. I do want to note that Colorado is an awesome place for pollinators. So we're in the top five states, depending on who you talk to. Sometimes we're in the top two or top three for butterfly diversity. So we've got about 233 different kinds of butterflies here in Colorado and over 900 species of bees. Um, and part of that is because we have have such diversity of habitat. We've got altitude, we've got um, different plant communities around the state, we've got these rivers that cut through the state and create sort of corridors for pollinators to move through. And we've also got a lot of open space here. Um, of course, things change in Colorado, and while things change, we still want to preserve that incredible diversity. And um, during this webinar, we are going to be talking about how things change over the seasons. And there's no denying that Colorado has dynamic seasons and dramatic seasonal changes. So weather can be unpredictable. Um, even within one season, we might veer from mild, temperate weather to scorching to, to blizzards. You just never know. Um, but pollinators have all sorts of ways of, of escaping the worst effects, and we'll be touching on that as well. So some migrate, some just go into a dormancy stage, others take shelter. So they don't all just like hop on a plane and head to Florida as soon as it starts flying, fly, uh, the snow flies. So we'll talk about this as well. So um, it's true, you know, um, when I talk to people about adding pollinator habitat, the easiest prescription to give is add flowers. You know, you add flowers to a habitat, you invariably see more pollinators. But um, it turns out also that if you want to see a diversity of pollinators, especially some of our natives, you want to look at the bigger picture. So um, the the recent research that's been done leads us to believe that some structural complexity in a habitat actually leads to more diversity and abundance of pollinators. So in this picture, you can um, see that 
you know, they've got everything from some fairly tall trees to some um, some cropland and 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 flowering plants and some water. It's not as if every backyard can have all of these elements, but looking at a landscape scale, um, we're looking for some of that, um, those plants that provide shelter and as well as those plants that provide food. Um, you'll also note that um, there are some abiotic um, aspects to a habitat that are important for pollinators. So a lot of times soil type can make a difference. And we'll talk about that when we talk about some of those ground nesting bees. So having access to soil, especially sandy soils, is a great um, thing that some types of pollinators need. Or access to water um, can also make a difference on whether you see certain pollinators or not. So um, just keep that in mind as we go through the year. Um, the, some of these things are going to come into play. Another kind of general note is, um, you know, po if pollinators are with us almost uh, throughout the whole year, they're going to need food for most of that time. And so um, really to emphasize that pollinators need food sources that are diverse and constant. Um, when I say diverse, if you think about it, if you want to attract a diversity of pollinators, they all have different shaped mouths, they all have different perching behavior or different um, abilities to manipulate blossoms to get to the good stuff inside. Um, and even something as, as simple as how big a pollinator is, it's going to um, influence which plants it's attracted to. And there's some pollinators that are very generalistic, and there's some plants that serve a wide variety of pollinators. But then we're going to kind of talk a little bit about how some pollinators are more specialized and require um, maybe a smaller range of plants. So by having a diversity of plants in your garden, you're really providing that buffet to a wide variety. You're serving a wide population of, of pollinators. Um, in terms of extending the bloom season, uh, you know, I've seen some butterflies flying as early as early March. Sometimes honeybees will go out and forage on a warm early um, spring or late winter day. And we saw our last monarch last year in November. So um, knowing that, um, whatever we can do to make that bloom season go from early spring to late fall um, really does serve the pollinators well. A lot of times that's the limiting resource for these pollinators. And then the other point I just, uh, there are two other points I want to uh, touch on on this slide. Uh, you know, what they have found is that some of our generalist pollinators like honeybees, they can access nectar and pollen out of a wide variety of plants and non-native plants versus native plants, they, they can do it all. But some of our small native bees or um, bees, beetles and flies that are pollinators, they have a harder time with some of those really highly cultivated non-native plants that we like to have in our garden. So if you can include some natives in your garden, that can be a great boon for some of these forgotten pollinators. And then finally, um, plants aren't just uh, pollen and nectar for these pollinators. They're also providing um, resources for them to have babies. They're providing shelter and protection from predators. So in, you, when you go plant shopping, sometimes it's great to choose a plant that can do double duty. I know um, I only have a limited wallet when I go to um, buy my plants, and so I want to make the most of my choices. So as we go through the seasons for this webinar, we are going to cover, for each season, we're going to talk about some commonly spotted pollinators and their life cycles and, and why we see them at certain times of year. We're also going to talk about those resources that are limiting during that time of year. So what your habitat can do to provide the things that they need the most during that season. And then finally, we're going to touch on things that are usually a good idea to do in the garden at that time of year. specifically. How are regular maintenance chores in the garden um, different for a pollinator habitat garden versus just a typical landscape that you might find in a residential area? Um, I have a feeling that many of the people who are joining us today are um, seasoned gardeners or at least have some experience working in the garden. So some of the chores are going to be pretty um, familiar and then other ones are going to be maybe a little surprising. So let's uh, start our walk through the seasons. And we're going to start with the season that we are just about on the cusp of today, although I have to admit I've been feeling it in the air already and seeing it in the leaves already. Um, so we're going to start with autumn. And here in this region, um, autumn can be one of the most beautiful seasons. Um, you know, it's not as hot. We're getting so those cooler mornings and evenings. Um, 
it can also be quite dry. So, you know, the other aspect of autumn, of course, is it can be very unpredictable. So we have a dry and sunny autumn, but um, all of a sudden we can have a very deep freeze, as happened a couple of years ago with that November freeze. Um, plant material is starting to die back for the season and go dormant. Those perennials and trees are maybe losing their leaves or turning brown. There's less um, floral, floral resources available. There's less nectar and pollen available um, for all of these reasons. So that's something that we're going to consider as we talk about some of the pollinators and plants that we see at this time of year. So one of my favorite pollinators I see in this time of year are our beetle pollinators. A lot of people don't even think of these guys as pollinators. And actually, a better word for them actually might be pollen eaters. <laughs> because they're actually, um, when you look back in the fossil record, our beetles are some of the first pollinators that we saw um, actually on plants, even before there were flowering plants there were pollinating beetles. And how they would work is they would get into a, a cone on a cycad, a pollen cone, and they would chew the heck out of it, and then they'd be covered with pollen, and they would visit an egg cone and chew the heck out of that too, and, mat and somehow um, some of that pollen ended up getting on eggs without getting eaten, and that is what propagated that cycad. So um, they have chewing mouth parts. They don't have that long proboscis like a butterfly does. Um, and the reason we see them in the autumn, um, so if you go out right now, there's a proliferation of little yellow aster type plants. So there's, you know, you've got your rabbit brush blooming, um, sometimes sneeze weed or goldenrod is blooming, some of our um, little asters are blooming. And these guys, because they have those chewing mouth parts, they are, um, they just have a pollen feast right now because there's so many of those plants blooming right now. Um, they usually start mating in late summer, early fall, and that's what we're seeing. And that's why I talk about them liking, liking to date and mate. So it's like they're taking their date out to dinner. They kind of meet out on these big pollen-filled, yellow, blooming asters. They kind of all get together in a big party, and they're kind of eating pollen while they're mating at the same time. So it's, um, you know, maybe a little risque, but um, it gets the job done. And um, then they lay eggs about this time of year. A little bit later, their larva will hatch. And they, these larvae love to eat things like aphids. Um, so they'll lay their eggs in decaying wood. So if you have any of that available, um, you know, great to leave it around your habitat. These larvae will then hibernate in leaf litter or loose soil as the fall gets colder. And then they'll reemerge in the spring and um, pupate kind of in that midsummer time. So that's why fall is such an important time for these beetles. So if you can get those late blooming plants, which I'll cover in a little bit, and leave some leaf litter around, maybe have some decaying wood, you're going to make a habitat for these beetles. Another pollinator that we often get questions about this time of year, although I will say we start seeing our first monarch usually in this part, in this region, we start seeing them as early as um, the first week of May uh, or this, about mid-May, sometimes um, more often that first week of June. Um, so we'll see them fairly early in the season. It's just that right now we tend to see more of them. Um, because they're beginning their migration season. And actually, if you've never been to the Journey North website, um, they actually have a map that shows um, where the monarchs are in their migration. And you can see that they're starting to move south at this point. And um, I believe that they are predicting that peak migration in this part of the country will be um, this week and next week. So keep your eyes out. If you've seen some monarchs, you will see them. Um, Right now is your best time. Uh, so milkweed is pretty important to them because of the um, cardiac glycosides that are in the leaves. Their larva can eat that plant without getting sick, unlike most critters. Um, and then they take those cardiac glycosides and use them as use those as a defense against potential predators. But I'm just going to say that actually. This time of year, milkweed is not the most important thing. If you've noticed any milkweed around your area, you will see that it's starting to die back, turn yellow, it's going to seed. Um, and because these monarchs are moving south, so right now we're here, um, they are starting to move south. Um, 
what they are really looking for now, because they are starting this huge journey down to their overwintering site in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, they are looking for fuel. So just like when you're going on a big road trip, you need to fuel up your car, these monarchs have to drink a lot of nectar to, um, to make it that far. They actually, most of them, are not able to reproduce at this time, or at least they're not putting their resources into reproduction. They are putting their resources into flight. Um, so again, having those late blooming plants, um, and if you are near a, a waterway, a lot of times you're more likely to see some of those monarchs because they can use that, those waterways to kind of help them find plants that are still green this time of year, have that moisture that's so important in this dry season. Um, I also want to note, I get a lot of questions about monarchs generally just because, um, you know, we you, people move here often from other parts of the country where they have more monarchs. And you can see from this map that we're sort of outside their major migration side, um, path. So, uh, you know, we do see them, absolutely, and we still provide important habitat for them, but we can't expect to see the just sheer numbers that they see further east from us and as well as on the west coast. So I've been promising that we talk about some of those late food sources for pollinators um, and here are some of the favorites from our butterfly pavilion gardens. So we noticed that getting into August into the end um, even mid-October some of the plants that do the best for us are plants like Liatris Maximilian sunflowers a lot of times will bloom all the way until Halloween if we don't get a severe freeze. Um, this is our Salvia azuria, which is a prairie native and does very well for us. Um, sedums are another really great late um, bloomer. Joe pieweed is just about finishing now, but did a really great job um, in the late part of the summer. And then um, rabbit brush is one of my favorites for this time of year. And when I mentioned those soldier beetles, it's one of their favorites too. So, um, you know, that's how you're going to feed those hungry pollinators that are looking for that last hurrah before um, the next season, which, you know, some people don't like to talk about the next season because it means cold and dressing up in a jacket. So, um, seasonal maintenance. So at Butterfly Pavilion in our habitat gardens, we wait to do our cleanup. Um, we don't like to cut everything down in the fall um, simply because um, what we find is that um, the plants, the perennials and the shrubs and things like that that we have in our gardens provide a lot of shelter for the wildlife that uses our gardens. So um, we try to avoid cutting down uh, plants unless they're providing some sort of hazard or if they're diseased. So if they're diseased plants, we absolutely want to remove them before um, before winter comes. Um, but uh, there's not usually a whole lot of those. Um, fall, early fall can be a great time to plant as well. Um, so uh, you don't want to wait too long. Um, the one limiting factor for that is if it's very dry, you'll want to do supplemental water while the um, temperature is relatively warm. And then we spend a lot of our time this time of year collecting seeds. So some of our natives like Mexican hat cone flower and blanket flower and um, some of those little purple asters um, are all going to seed right now. And so if we collect those seeds, we can use them for creating more habitat um, so we do a lot of that. And then what we try to do in terms of preparing for the next year is some of the seed we might wait till spring to plant, but a lot of it we actually wait for sort of that first burst of snowy weather that usually comes in fall. Um, and we wait for that. And as soon as we see that in the forecast, we go and we put down some of that native seed and let it get watered in naturally that way. So those are some of the major um, tasks that we see happening in autumn in our gardens here. But I promised you it, we would talk about winter, um, not necessarily the easiest time of year to see um, pollinators, but still it's important to think about them every time of year. So um, winter is, uh, you know, typically very cold, but I will say that here in um, the Denver metro area, we can have days that are in the 60s in January. Um, so snowy sm spells might very well be punctuated by warmer sunny days um, and uh, you know sometimes we have snow but sometimes again it is quite dry so knowing that um, we want to keep that shelter in our gardens but 
Believe it or not, there is a pollinator that sometimes we see in the winter, and I'd be really interested to know how many people have seen this butterfly. This is called a morning cloak butterfly, and um, the reason why we do see them occasionally in the winter is they overwinter as adults, which is fairly infrequent for butterflies in this area. So um, they usually shelter under loose tree bark or um, in uh, eaves of buildings, and uh, they will um, usually be seen somewhere in a like riparian co corridor. So if you live somewhere where there's a creek nearby and some cottonwoods or some aspens, um, you may very well see these butterflies emerge in the winter. And of course the question is, well, what are they eating in the winter when there's really nothing blooming at all? Um, they will are one of the butterflies that will drink tree sap or the juices from rotting fruits. So um, just as a kind of a fun thing, it's like there are pollinators all year round. And of course, um, you know, as much as we would like to maybe knit little sweaters for every single pollinator that we want to protect in the winter that stays in this area, um, that actually the best shelters that we can provide are usually the natural plants that grow in an area. So uh, plants with hollow stems, some of those soft stemmed shrubs like um, red twig dogwood and golden currant. They have soft wood that plant um, pollinating insects can use um, to burrow inside. So some of our solitary bees will do that. Um, if you can leave some leaf litter around your garden or grow ground covering plants um, throughout your garden, that does provide some insulation um, from those um, harsh winds and cold temperatures. And of course, if you have some evergreens in your garden, that also provides some shelter. And you might even notice um, you know, evidence of insects using those plants. Um, snow is an insulator too, but as I said, it can be quite dry in the winter and we don't necessarily see those, um, see a lot of insulation from snow for much of the winter, depending on where you are. And then I do want to touch a little bit on man-made shelters. So um, there are a lot of really great sort of bee houses and bug houses, and I've seen some butterfly houses. Um, those may not be used that much in the winter because um, a lot of the things that um, use those shelters primarily use them in the spring, summer, um, into fall. And then we don't really see a whole lot of use of those in the winter time. So you might consider using winter as a time to sort of clean those um, houses out. Things like butterfly houses often attract things like wasps and spiders, so you want to kind of clear those out if you do use them. Um, bee houses, um, it's a good idea to kind of see how how full of debris they are um, because you know, if a bee goes in and perhaps has some sort of disease or parasite, you don't want that to be passed along to the bee population at large. So it's a good idea to use this kind of slower season to, to check out those man-made shelters if you use them. So in the winter, we generally try not to um, disturb our habitat too very much um, because it is providing shelter for a lot of our pollinators, but there is always the chance of a big ice storm or snowstorm damaging some of our trees or shrubs. So um, winter is a time for us to, you know, if snow is falling and there's a way to shake some of that snow off um, so that branches don't get broken, or if branches do get broken, managing that damage, um, that's kind of a task that we find ourselves doing in the winter. But of course, um, winter wouldn't be um, as fun as it is without those wonderful seed catalogs and plant catalogs coming through the mail. So it's a good time to take a breath, plan your season for next year. And then I just had to joke, this is something that we have to do in the winter, and that is putting up holiday lights. And I don't know how everybody else um, has to deal with holiday lights, but that is something that we have to do this time of year at Butterfly Pavilion. So eventually the days do get longer. Um, and the soil temperature starts rising um, as the air temperature rises. But spring is an extremely fickle season. I think anyone who remembers this past spring will remember days that were just gorgeous. Um, and you really thought, oh, spring is here. And then even in May, seeing the, that snow and that wind come in. So if you're a pollinator out in the habitat, um, you are ready to start gathering some of those floral resources that are finally appearing after that barren season, um, but you may have to um, kind of 
find shelter very quickly because we know those storms do move in very, very quickly. Um, this is really kind of the launching of when we start seeing a lot more of our pollinators. Um, and I do want to show um, some of the pollinators that you're likely to see in spring, but I do also want to note that this is really a big time for the moisture. Um, this is really our moistest season. So um, gardeners take advantage of it and so do pollinators. Um, so some of that moisture that we see in spring lasts us um, through the rest of the year in many ways. So let's take a look at some of these pollinators we are likely to see. So even fairly early in, in April, we might see queen, bu but, uh, queen bumblebees emerge from their nests. So usually it's just the queen that overwinters. And um, when she gets out of her underground burrow, which is often in, say, an, an abandoned mouse nest or um, we've had them nesting inside of abandoned prairie dog burrows um, or crevices or things like that. They aren't very good diggers so they'll just be opportunistic and use um, whatever kind of um, safe spot. I've even seen them use tool sheds before. Um, but at, when the queens emerge they are needing to gather a lot of pollen and nectar to start building their colony. So they need it for themselves to fuel up all the eggs that they are going to lay, but then they also need it to feed the babies as they, um, as they grow. So um, those early blooming plants are so vital at this stage. And so um, if your garden right now is starting to bloom in May, you might look for ways to make it bloom even earlier, so into early April or even into late March. So Colorado has over 20 species of bumblebees in the state. Um, and um, it's kind of fun to try to identify them. The ones that we see most frequently in our suburban community um, are Bombus nevidens nevidensis, which has like mostly yellow markings with a few, like a little black spot on their thorax and a little black butt. And then Bombus huntii, and that's pretty um, easy to identify by these orange bands high up on their abdomen. So those are the two that we see most often, but um, depending on where you live, especially if you're up in the foothills or the mountains or um, further east, you're likely to see some different species. Um, they are, bumblebees are one of those pollinators that actually don't mind high altitudes. Um, a lot of our other um, pollinators that we see, um, you, they start to trickle out um, with tree line. So uh, bumblebees are tough, they're stout, they can deal with colder temperatures, and that's why we see them early in the spring. And this one has always surprised me how early we see hummingbirds um, in this area. So um, this year I started seeing hummingbirds pass through our gardens in April and I was shocked because I thought those little bodies that need to stay so warm and those nights are getting so cold. So again, hummingbirds need such a great deal of fuel to be able to um, fuel their migration up to the mountains. They also need a lot of fuel to keep warm on those cold spring nights. So um, having both lots of nectar available at this time of year in April and early May, um, as well as roosting spaces, so sheltered spaces where they can um, hang out at night on their way up to the mountains. Um, if they get too cold, they go into a state called torpor, and in that torpor state, it can be very difficult for them to warm up. Um, so um, having those sheltered spaces on the landscape can help a lot with that. But spring does get warmer and you have fewer and fewer of those cold, um, cold weather events. And by May, a lot of times we are starting to see some of our larger butterflies. And I always think of the two-tailed swallowtail as our sort of Memorial Day butterfly. Um, I have seen them earlier than that, but for some reason, um, that's when I really start noticing them. They're our largest butterfly here in Colorado. And um, a lot of people tell me that they have the same one visit them um, many days in a row while, you know, during the season. So they do tend to go on a kind of a territorial loop. And so if you see one, you might see the same one the next day about the same time. Um, and these are, you know, showy, they're charismatic. Um, they have pretty long proboscises. So they um, go for flowers that have kind of that long tubular shape. Um, they also like to sit while they eat, unlike a hummingbird that is uh, working its little tail off the entire time. Um, 
two-tailed swallowtails prefer a place where they can kind of sip and sit at the same time. Of course, it's not all about nectar for these guys. Um, they are also looking to lay their eggs. And um, swallowtail butterfly caterpillars start off, um, you know, when they hatch, they will eat plants such as ash trees, um, cottonwoods occasionally, choke cherries occasionally. Um, there are a lot of ash trees in a lot of suburban neighborhoods, which is one of the reasons why the two-tailed swallowtail is fairly frequently seen in, in neighborhoods. Um, but I want to point out that when it hatches, it's about the size of an eyelash. And by the time the caterpillar is full size, it's almost the size of a thumb. So that's a lot of growing. It would be the equivalent of a human baby um, growing up to be the size of a school bus. <laughs> so their job is to eat and eat and eat, which is one of the reasons why um, we like to caution people, you know, we want butterflies, but we also want to understand that their part of their life cycle requires a lot of leaf material, a very specific leaf material. So having those host plants in the garden, you know, you hopefully want to see caterpillars. And I want to just kind of reassure everybody, we have ash trees on the pop, uh, property, and we have had caterpillars before. And even with the amount of eating that they do, it's fairly infrequent that we actually see signs of eating um, because the trees are so large and the insects are eating a lot, but it's still, it's easy to camouflage their eating. So, you know, if you have host plants for certain butterflies, maybe just make sure that there's enough of them so that they can eat without um, the gardener being a little worried about signs of chewing. So in spring, because we do have this unpredictable weather um, uh, that can veer from cold to, to quite warm, um, sun can be a limiting resource. So a lot of um, pollinators, especially butterflies, require um, some place that they can sit and warm up their flight muscles. They are ectothermic, so they rely on that external temperature to regulate their metabolism. So on an early spring morning, um, it might be too cold for bees and flies and butterflies to fly. So if you're able to incorporate things like boulders or open areas in your garden, um, that provides that resource for those springtime pollinators. If you have a shady garden, that is actually a little less um, attractive to pollinators, they really are um, more frequently found in sunny habitats. So um, if you want to kind of start your bloom season early, one of the things that we notice in our gardens here at Butterfly Pavilion is um, having bulbs and flowering trees and shrubs in our garden really is a lifesaver. So some of our earliest bloomers are things like dwarf iris or some of our species tulips. Um, Golden Current is um, one of my favorite early spring bloomers um, because it will bloom in April uh, when uh, very few other things other than the bulbs are blooming, um, but it blooms very heavily. And um, if you have enough of it, it can provide a lot of nectar for um, bumblebees, but also hummingbirds. Our, our hummingbirds, when they're passing through, that's really their lifesaver um, because hummingbirds have a harder time visiting things like flowering chokecherry or um, crab apple, things like that. Um, I want to point out how different all these flower shapes are. So we have some that have longer tubes, um, some that are more open and dish shaped. All of that can accommodate these different size mouthpieces and these different abilities to kind of sit and eat or hover and eat. Um, so having kind of a wide variety of shapes can really be helpful for that. And then, of course, um, in spring, once things are really starting to green up, that's when we go back and clean up our garden. Um, so that's when we kind of clean up your last year's growth, um, when, especially once the temperature is warmer and um, our pollinators are requiring a little less shelter. But to be honest, the biggest thing we are doing in the spring is weeding. Now, there are some weeds that can provide helpful resources for pollinators, um, but we draw, make a distinction between those weeds that are going to outcompete some of the plants that we want to um, really promote for our pollinators and those weeds that are pretty uh, lackadaisical and maybe a little less, um, a, a little less aggressive. So uh, most of the weeding that um, we do is by hand, um, but there are some other things you can do in terms of um, putting down, uh, you know, pre-emergent uh, corn gluten or um, kind of 
uh, mulching the soil, things like that. Um, and then, of course, once spring uh, gets a little less unpredictable, we do a great deal of planting. Um, a lot of the plants that we use are perennials, but we also like to add a few annuals just for that kind of constant floral presence throughout the rest of the growing season. And then finally, um, you know, it's not yet a memory, but it's good to talk about summer. This is really the high season for pollinators. So this is when you see the most pollinators um, in terms of number as well as diversity. Um, summers tend to be hot and dry with maybe occasional um, thunderstorms. Um, that's when you have a lot of sunshine, which is the natural companion of pollinators. Um, we may still be benefiting from that spring moisture um, to keep some of these summer blooming plants going. So let's kind of talk about some of our native bees because this is really the season when you're likely to see them. And um, a lot of our native bees um, are relying on garden habitats for nesting um, as well as for food. So one of my favorite little native bees, is this is a picture of our green sweat bee, which is a pretty easy name to remember because it is green. Um, it kind of looks like it's been dipped in glitter, very disco bee. Um, and they're fairly small, so less than um, maybe like two tenths of an inch to four tenths of an inch long. They're very, you know, if you have the habitat for them, you'll see a lot of them because what they'll do is they're solitary nesters, but each sort of mother bee will have, you know, a few dozen um, offspring. So within their sort of nesting area, you'll see um, many of them kind of emerging. And these will nest in, you know, a rotting log or soft stemmed um, shrub. Um, so having those types of um, plant materials in your garden will um, provide shelter for these little sweat bees. The reason why they're called sweat bees is, of course, they are attracted to the salt in human sweat. And I have had them go into my armpit before, not to be too gross. Um, and, and sometimes they will, um, you know, kind of sting. Uh, but their sting is very um, kind of weak. It's not a very painful sting. But if, you know, maybe they get caught in your armpit, the, you know, they feel trapped. Uh, they have to let you know, like, hey, I'm in here. Uh, but anyway, the, you don't have to worry about their sting too very much. It's not a very severe sting. Another one of our little native bees, again, not very much um, larger than the sweat bee, is our minor bees. And the way that you can identify these is by the pale bands on their abdomens. So um, these guys nest in the ground. Um, so they have solitary nests, but a lot of times their nests are in groups. And many times I hear concern from people who see bees coming in and out of these little holes in the ground and I actually have a picture. Um, so they see these bees coming in and out of the ground and, and maybe they're um, associating them with things like yellow jackets, which also have an ability to nest in the ground, and they're, um, they, they're worried about them stinging. Again, these guys sting are very, very light, um, and they're not, they're not aggressive. Um, they're very unlikely to sting. So, uh, you know, keeping bare areas and allowing them to nest if you possibly can. Um, in a lot of cases, their seasons are very brief. So you'll sort of see them active for a couple of weeks, and then you won't see them uh, for the rest of the year. So allowing, if you already have an open space where bees are nesting, don't feel like you absolutely have to landscape everything. You can leave a little bit bare and save yourself some work. So another uh, native bee that you're likely to see are leaf cutter bees. And a lot of times you won't necessarily see the bee. You'll see the evidence that they were visiting your plants because they'll cut these perfect little half moon si um, shaped little pieces out of plants like roses, um, other plants in the rose family. I've seen them cut things out of crab apple. And what they do is they normally nest in cavities that are already dug for them. Just like bumblebees, they're not into digging their own holes. Mining bees are much more industrious in that way. Um, but they will cut these leaf pieces and go into a cavity and kind of chew them up and create chambers for their larvae out of these pieces of leaf. So, um, you know, whenever I see those little pieces cut out of the leaf, I actually am very glad because I know that there are leaf cutter bees in the area and the damage that they do to the plants is 
fairly slight. So um, plants usually can withstand that without any negative impact. Um, a great way to identify these leaf cutter bees is they, instead of carrying pollen on their legs like a lot of other bees do, they carry it on their bellies. So they have these little hairy patches on their bellies called scopa. And um, so if you see a bee with a bright yellow belly, it's probably a leaf cutter bee carrying pollen. So um, finally, another great sort of ground nesting bee. These are much larger. They're digger bees. Again, um, they are sort of solitary, but they're often their nests are grouped together in bare spots. Um, I will say that these guys fly so fast. They have these huge eyes, they see really well, and they just zip around like crazy, which also kind of sometimes freaks people out a little bit because they're seeing these bees, they're zipping around like a crazy thing, and they think automatically like they're out to kill me. But really, they're just very busy, they have a very brief season, they have to kind of move on with their lives. You better get up, just get out of their way. <laughs> um, but you know, native bees are so important, but I never want to forget our flies, our pollinating flies, because I think they get forgotten most of the time. So there are a number of different kinds of flies. Um, there are flies called hoverflies that you might see around. They're actually striped black and yellow like little bees. Um, there's also bee flies, like this one pictured here that's fuzzy. So a lot of bees look like, a lot of flies look like bees for a good reason. Who's going to mess with the bee, right? Um, and these guys have shorter tongues for the most part. So a lot of times they go to shallower, smaller flowers. Um, but they, uh, you know, also need kind of mo naturally moist sites to lay their eggs because their larvae do need a little bit of moisture. I will also say that their larvae often are really great predators. So if you have things like aphids in your garden, you kind of want these flies around. Um, uh, they're pollinating your plants and they're doing some pest management for you. So moisture in the summer can be a very limiting factor, especially when we have a very dry summer. Um, so something that you can consider is um, allowing yourself a little mud puddle. Now, a lot of male butterflies will go to mud puddles to um, get salts for reproduction. They kind of function like little singles bars. So they are busy getting salts in their diet, and then a female flies by, and they all chase her. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, but it's not like you have to have a mud, actual mud puddle in your garden if that doesn't suit your aesthetics. Um, one of the things that we often recommend is creating a dish with a little bit of compost in it and keeping it moist, and then um, you're able to see those, um, those butterflies visit. Honeybees use moisture, of course, to um, air condition their hives, um, and many of the time that I've come home to see a honeybee in my dog's water bowl outside. Um, so putting some rocks or some sticks in a bird bath allow them to kind of get close to the water without getting submerged. So those are some things you can do for moisture. Most pollinators get, you know, instead of drinking a glass of water like we do in the summer, they're actually getting most of their moisture for, from nectar. Um, but moisture is important for other uses for these guys. So in the summer, it's a lot easier to have um, great flowering plants. But some of the favorites that we see are things like our poppy mallow, um, lead plant, blanket flower, and of course, butterfly milkweed. Um, when we can get plants, as I said, that do double duty, that's especially great. So um, things like our lead plant is not only a nectar and pollen source, but also a host plant for silver spotted skippers. And of course, milkweed is an important nectar for a lot of pollinators, but the monarch will lay its eggs on there. So um, poppy mallow is a host also for fritillary butterflies. So if you see fritillaries in your area, you might want to think about including that plant. In the summer, um, that's when we're most likely to see pests. Um, but uh, thankfully, here in Colorado, we don't get attacked to the same extent as other parts of the country do. By keeping a close eye on our garden and doing lots of monitoring walks and seeing how things are going, we can keep pest populations from getting too big. We also have a kind of a casual threshold, knowing that our gardens are supposed to be more of a habitat feel. We don't necessarily have to worry about every single chew mark on a leaf. And then using things like beneficial insects or making habitat for predators to come in and eat any pests that we do have. Um, things like allowing ladybugs to really uh, gain a really great foothold in our garden. Um, that can help manage pests. And then this is a job I actually love, but deadheading um, keeps those plants blooming throughout the summer. So that's another big thing that we're doing this summer, all the while still weeding, of course. So 
um, you know, this is the same garden four times a year. This is a garden for every in every season, and it's a habitat in every season. And this is something that actually brings a lot of interest to the garden because we know we're going to see different things happen, and that our garden is providing those resources for pollinators all year long. So thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Um, this, um, you know, I can't wait to hear how pollinators are benefiting from all this great habitat that's going to happen. So thank you. Wow, Amy, thank you so much for that fabulous presentation. I really appreciate that. Let me jump back on over, popping up some of our contact information. Everyone see the screen all right? You see this, Amy, now? Yeah, I see it. All right. So that presentation was so engaging and informative, and I really appreciate all the thought you put into creating that. It, you could tell it was so organized. And I really liked how you captured each kind of the, snap, the snapshot for each season to talk about how to provide habitat for those various pollinators, like who you might be expecting to see, and also that maintenance component, and the photos just really enhance that. So thank you so much for spending time on all of that and joining us today, Amy. That was a pleasure. Well, thanks for having and, me. Yeah. So there may now be some folks in the audience that have some questions on the materials that you presented. I've gotten a few um, throughout the presentation. So feel free at this time if you want to use that chat feature on the toolbar to send those questions to me. Um, we have about 10 minutes for this portion. And then again, my contact and Amy's contact information, including our email and the website, is up on your screen. So feel free to contact us if we aren't able to get to your uh, question today. Uh, but for the first one, Amy, this is from Levon, And she says her milkweed plants do not flower for some reason. So would they still be helpful to monarchs, or maybe you have any suggestions or how-tos on to get some successful blooms? That's a great question because we certainly see that, um, especially on some of our um, along open spaces and things like that, I've noticed that. And for some reason this year I'm seeing more of that. Um, but a lot of the times when you don't see it bloom, it's just because it's young. And so it just doesn't have the resources needed to provide the bloom. The good news is that it doesn't have to bloom to be important for monarchs. Really, the, what the monarch is looking for is in the summer, they're looking for somewhere to lay those eggs. And as long as it has leaves, it has somewhere to lay the eggs. So, um, you know, I would say give it a little time. Um, you're probably going to see it bloom at some point once those stems get nice and fat and, and the plant is well established. But in the meantime, you're still providing excellent habitat for monarchs. What site selection would you recommend for milkweed? That was kind of a follow-up question with that. Yeah, so um, milkweed likes a lot of sun. Um, and it's one of those plants that's fairly drought tolerant, but it seems to like um, it likes it sort of in a drainage area. So where we see it really be successful is um, near um, sort of we have it sort of in the buffer zone between a very dry area and where the riparian area begins along Big Dry Creek. Um, it really loves that area. So it doesn't need to be wet all the time, but it does like those occasional bursts of moisture. Um, and that's true of uh, some of the other milkweed species as well. You don't need to water them all the time, but they do need kind of little um, bursts of moisture um, enough to water them in. Great. Thanks for answering that, Amy, so thoughtfully. Another question, uh, more of a comment too, just the, all the photos that you use really showcased how beautiful Butterfly Garden is. Is this something that people go for a self-guided tour or do you also give guided tours um, at, at the Butterfly Pavilion? So uh, our gardens are open to the community all the time. So um, anyone who wants to explore is welcome to visit our gar outdoor gardens. Um, we do, in the summertime, sometimes provide guided tours. We call them garden safaris. And they typically are at 1.30 in the afternoons. But I know that often they alternate those programs with our nature trail as well. Um, but uh, our educators are really great at that. There's also opportunities um, kind of um, ahead of time if somebody wanted to call and book a group. I sometimes give tours of the gardens. And that's always really fun too. But that, that would be require a reservation. Perfect. Well, I can't wait to join the Garden Safari because I would like a personal <laughs> tour of this. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, I like butterflies and bees in my garden, but the wasps are just driving me crazy. Me too. What can I do <laughs> with fewer of them around without or resorting to pesticides? 
Yeah, you know, this year has just been crazy for wasps, and I've been hearing it from so many people. Um, and one of the things that I like to encourage people to think about is when they see things like yellow jackets or paper wasps, a lot of times what's really allowing those um, wasps to make a foothold is the shelter situation. So those yellow jackets are looking for kind of um, crevices in many cases or um, whole, you know, kind of existing holes. Those paper wasps are looking for protected areas to create those paper nests. Um, and so keeping a lookout for where those wasps are coming to and from can provide um, kind of a, allow you to address them. Some of the things that we do is we will wash um, buildings, you know, we'll wash the side of buildings once we knock that nest down with soap and water because that smell that they leave behind um, allows them to kind of say, hey, we should build the nest here again. Um, so, you know, go out at night, knock that nest down when they're not that active, and then wash that area. And it may take a few times, but really trying to address the shelter situation can really help in the long term. That is really helpful. We just put in a wooden pergola this year. Oh. We've already been scoping out, so that is what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to wash my pergola. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question, and then we'll just kind of do our wrap-up. Uh, this person lives in a small town home with not much of a yard, so how can you increase pollinator habitat with just small acreage? So um, I mentioned at the very beginning that, you know, adding flowers can be your first step to creating more habitat for pollinators. And so um, I know a lot of people with not a lot of property who really rely on container gardens, and it's an easy way to keep them maintained, um, you know, and it's, it's delightful to look at, um, but you will probably, you know, if you put some container gardens around your, your patio or around your front door, it's very likely that you'll see some of those um, bees and, and butterflies. I know that I had a huge group of sweat, green sweat bees on my container gardens that I have outside of my door this summer, and it was such a delight to watch them every evening. Well, Amy, again, thank you for all your great information. You're just a walking book of knowledge, so thank you. <laughs> I just want to remind uh, some folks about upcoming ways or upcoming events and ways to stay involved with our program and kind of our final remarks. First, I just want to, again, reiterate a big thank you for joining us today and Amy's informative presentation. We also have a, another upcoming event we hope to see you at called Hometown Habitat. We're doing a film screening at Denver Botanic Garden uh, in the evening at 6.30 p.m. on October 18th, a weekday night. Uh, Hometown Habitat is called uh, Stories of Bringing Nature Home. It shows what everyday Americans are doing to help bring back more native species through projects and programs across the country. It's a 90-minute environmental education documentary by award-winning director Katherine Zimmerman, and it also features author and uh, Professor Dr. Douglas Talmy as that narrative thread, thread throughout. And we were excited enough that Habitat Hero was filmed for some additional footage uh, for the movie uh, during an educational workshop and a planting event that we did um, during a planting of a Habitat Hero demonstration garden. Uh, so we were certainly honored to be selected as one of these inspiring stories of community commitment to conservation landscaping. Uh, Amy was actually uh, one of our panelists. We did the, the inaugural opening in Boulder two weekends ago at the Boulder Public Library, and she sat on the panel for that. And we'll also have some additional panelists on the October 18th event. And I also encourage you to apply to become a Habitat Hero to give you that recognition that you deserve. And I hope uh, you all enjoy this autumn season that is upon us and that Amy reminded us uh, so the changing seasons are ready afoot. Again, thank you, Amy, for your time, and thank you all for joining us today during our noontime webinar series. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Any everybody. Final words? No, words? just uh, good, happy gardening. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And we just got a few comments rolling in saying that they really enjoyed this presentation. So oh, thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone enjoy the rest of your hump day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.